just to begin, I read somewhere that it was on hearing a recording of Heartbreak Hotel that you were inspired to take up a career in music. What, what was it about that recording? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, uh, I listened to music incessantly growing up, and I just um, always had a radio, a portable radio, up to my ear. So um, I just remember hearing that when it first came out as a kid. I guess I was nine years old, and I just it just opened <laughs> new horizons i guess the sound of that uh, echo and uh, of course his his uh his sort of smoldering kind of delivery was great i mean for a little kid it was just amazing yeah was there ever going to be any other career path for you uh well no it wasn't really i i didn't really i mean i always loved music but um i think it wasn't until I was in my early teens that uh, I, I really sort of got uh, the idea of, of doing it for, um, you know, I don't know if, if I was thinking of the long haul, but uh, I, my brother, actually, uh, my who's three years older than me, we used to go to this overnight camp when I was, we were kids. <laughs> and he, I had no choice. He made me sing in front of his <laughs> his his bunk mates. And uh, as a result, I I sort of liked the I liked the reaction. You know, this was before my voice changed, and I sang. I sounded just like Jackie Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it was you know. So I sang in front of these kids, and uh, I was flabbergasted to see the reaction. You know. Talk about some of the, the. I was accepted. I was sort of accepted by these older older kids, you know. Yeah, some of the early bands you were involved with. Can you tell us about the the Confidentials and the Newports? Uh, well, the Confidentials was the first band I was with. I was about fourteen, fifteen, and uh, you know, basically it was just cover songs of the t uh, from the songs of that time, and um, you know, it was school dances and after uh, teen clubs and um, you know things like that. And then when I uh, was, I guess, sixteen, I graduated to the to the Newports and. Uh, which was, it was sort of a, con a conglomerate of the Confidentials and a group that had already actually gotten somewhat of a name in the Washington, D.C. area called the Newports. And we sort of merged, and, uh, uh, and then we started doing, you know, um, fraternity parties. And actually, I think the first club I did was when I was 17, maybe 16. I was underage, and... Uh, Actually, it was in a difficult, uh, not a very nice part of Washington, D.C. It was across from the Greyhound bus station. <laughs> and uh, it was quite, a, quite an, uh, an experience, you know. Um, we would do 45 minutes on, 15 minutes off, and like five shows a night. So it was, it was grueling. I mean, I remember I couldn't even talk the, the day after these shows. So we did it, I think, for a week straight, and that was, that was my introduction into the real world of the music business, I think. Yeah. I believe you, you spent a period of time in the National Guard. Well, I did. I yeah. did that. How, how do you look back on that time there? What are your memories of that? Hell. Hell. It was just hell. Yeah. I did not like the service at all. You know, I mean, uh, it was uh, it was difficult for me. I mean, I, I did it, and I'm glad I did, but uh, at the time it was not pleasant. You had a, a period of time away from music, but came back into it in, a, in an exciting time in the mid '70s, around the time of the emergence of the new wave scene in New York. I imagine it must have been a, an inspiring scene to, to work in. Well, it was. Uh, you know, the New York uh, scene at that time <clears throat> was was very exciting. I I actually had um, uh, answered an ad for a singer. I was just, I, you know, I had no I, I no introduction to anybody on the music scene in New York. At that time, because I, I actually had a business of my own, I in New York, and uh, when I got out of that, I decided to get back into the music. I mean, I was I always knew I would, but uh, anyway, I uh, I got into this group called Tough Darts, and uh, although the lyrics were not really where I was coming from, it was a good way to uh, to vent my sort of anger at the time. I had just split up from a, a, a marriage of eight years, and I was 
met at the world so it was a, a good <laughs> a good venue for me and um i, I did that for about uh, i guess three years and then two years maybe on the local scene and then um was sort of i guess you could say discovered by richard goddard the producer who uh, made blondie and and people like uh, richard hell and uh of course wrote my boyfriend's back and the real McCoys, you know, uh, I want candy and songs like that. So he's, you know, he brought me to uh, 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 an independent label at the time. It was called Private Stock, and uh, we did two albums for Private Stock, and then moved on to RCA, which was very exciting for me, of course, being the home of the King. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was a good period for me uh, through uh, the late seventies. Up to the mid '80s, I guess. You got to in the late '70s team up with with the great Link Ray. W were you a long time fan of his before you teamed up with him? Well, you know, I of course knew of Link. He was from the Virginia area, and I'm from DC, so I always, in fact, I used to see him on a local TV show called The Milk Grant. It was like a dance party show in in the Maryland area. But uh, when I was a little kid, I saw him at this amusement park in Maryland called the Glen Echo Amusement Park. So that was a thrill for me because, of course, he was a generation older than me. And I'm talking about when Rumble was out. So that was, I, I was a little kid, you know. Mm. And uh, they used to have performances at, at this amusement park. And I remember seeing Link there. So it was, it was, it was, it was a real trip, man, because, you know, at that time, I mean, being a little kid, you know, I mean, I'm talking about like nine, ten years old, you could see the beehive hairdos and the leather jackets and shit, you know, so it was it was exciting. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you even found yourself with a, a chart hit on your hand with Red Hot. Do you recall how that one came together? Uh, how how the al album came together? Uh, well, the song the song itself, Red Hot. Oh well, I I I, I liked the song. I always did. So uh, it's just a tune that we decided to, to record you know um unfortunately i was not writing at the time i wish i had been because uh um there's so many reissue albums out that i'm not making a dime off of because rca owned all those masters uh, unfortunately but uh um that that was attracted to became pretty successful in the states because at the time nobody was doing that type of music here so it was actually sort of a resurgence of uh uh, I guess you could say rockabilly, and um, uh, before the Stray Cats were were in uh, even a, a concept, actually. Did it surprise you that it became the hit it did? Because they just said it was totally against everything else that was happening commercially at the time. Uh, well, you know, we had a great look, and uh, and and the show was powerful, and I think it. Uh, well, of course, we got we got a tremendous amount of airplay, and unfortunately. It was before the, the MTV, the video TV um, thing, was even uh, a concept. Um, because if we had been on MTV, we would have been huge, man. I mean, because we got lots of radio play, tremendous amount of air, radio, you know, airplay. Was it a little bit frustrating at times seeing bands later, as you say, the Stray Cats in, in later years have success commercially with a, with a musical style that was certainly connected to what you were doing earlier? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I have to admit it was, yeah. Um, nobody was using upright bass, nobody was using, uh, you know, doing that genre. So, I mean, uh, you know, although we never really tried to recreate those the, that, that sound, uh, you know, there are bands now that, of course, try to recreate it to the to the um you know exactly like the old school but uh, i always uh, took it to a different place with a harder edge to it that's why i was um <clears throat> considered working with link you know who was a heavy player and and then later on of course chris bedding who was a very modern and much much different than the uh, traditional rockabilly guitar players how would you sum up your working relationship with link ray was it a, a happy working uh, relationship uh, Link and I were, were, yeah, well, you know, we, we hit it off famously when we met first met, and I guess he was sort of like a, an older brother to me. We were very close. Um, I, I must say, though, towards the end it got very difficult because, uh, as you as you must know, Link is, knows one way to play, and that's full 
well, volume. <laughs> <laughs> so it became very difficult for me on stage as a singer. And, um, uh, you know, I think we took it as far as we could. It, it was just, uh, he was great in the studio, but live it was, it was just very difficult for me. As you mentioned, you very much looked the part on stage too. You portrayed the image of of that 50s rockabilly act. Were, was projecting that image particularly important to you at the time? Well, you know, I had a look, and that's what, that's what that's where I was coming from. Uh, you know, I mean, um, I still wear my hair the same way, but my my belt size has gotten about twice as big. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, we've all gotten a lot older since then. But uh, <laughs> you know, I I I, I I'm happy to say that uh, I'm still out there singing, and uh, I'm, I I feel like I'm singing better than ever, actually. And uh, it's great to be working with Chris Spedding again, who you know we have had a a ten year um, run as as mates on stage and in the studio, and then we stopped working together for for like thirteen years, and uh, we're back together again. So I'm very excited about that. That's fantastic to hear. Uh, yeah. Did, did the image work against you at all? Do you th- do you think you found people categorizing you too much as a mm-hmm. nostalgia type act? Yeah, you know you can get pigeon pigeonholed. There's no doubt about that. Um, but for people that know my my really know my music, uh, you know I've always done country music. I've done contemporary, like modern. Uh, I mean, original new songs as well as as rockabilly. In fact, the show consists probably of more R and B um, sort of rock and roll tunes than than uh, rockabilly. But you know, you get you get sort of tagged with something, and uh, that's the way it goes. Mm. And unfortunately, these days, you know, it's very difficult to get airplay. So, um, I, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I have a, a fo- the following I do. I'm unfortunately wish there was, uh, you know, the, the the radio has changed drastically, as you as you know, and of course the record business is, is nil these days. So, I mean, it's all downloads, and um, so the day of. of record companies or record company support is sort of long gone unless you're like a superstar so it's uh, the business has changed drastically so it's 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 difficult it's it's not easy these days but uh we're still doing it now you were at one stage uh given the the bruce springsteen song fire to to record but unfortunately mm-hmm. for you the pointer sisters uh came in on top of you and covered it around the same time having great success with it did you have hopes that that your version of the song would would have that sort of success well you know i never really uh i mean i i was always, i was of course flattered that bruce gave me the song you know we were really close back then and um I, I, you know i didn't uh, i mean i liked the song a lot but i didn't really uh, I didn't really think of it as a career move, you know. I didn't think of it that way. I just thought it was a really good song, and and it, <clears throat> that it was uh, cool that Bruce gave it to me, you know. They mentioned you've teamed up with Chris Spedding again uh, this time around. Is it is it a better working relationship than than before? You're both older and wiser now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we know what we're we're, <laughs> we're aware of what we're doing now. <laughs> I mean, I admit it. Uh, we were we were bad boys back then. <laughs> we were. <laughs> We were naughty boys, <laughs> uh, so it's good. It's good to be, uh, you know, clean and sober, and 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 really, uh, it's it's such a different ball game now, and um, it's it's much more, much more fun actually. Yeah, more than the uh, the distinguished gentleman now. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, we'll still have a cocktail now and then, but uh, uh, <clears throat> not before or during the show. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's that's the way it goes. But. Um, what else can I tell you, man? Yeah. Another great player you worked with over the years was Danny Gatton. Uh, my dear friend Danny. Yeah, what a, what a, what a, what a loss that was. Yeah. Well, Danny, of course, is from uh, my same area as well. And uh, one of the most unsung guitar heroes, uh, <clears throat> what is it, the best kept secret, I think it's called. Uh, one of the best kept secrets. Yeah, Danny Gatton was a monster. And... Uh, of course, he was a more jazz sort of country-oriented style player than, of course, Link or or Chris. But um, I loved working with him. He was very, um, he was great for that sort of uh, certainly the rockabilly sound. That's for sure. Yeah. Do you have any theories on why he never really achieved the recognition that that he deserved? Well, you know, I think Danny really did not like 
performing. He did not like uh, going on the road. He would have rather just stayed home working on his cars and and riding the, riding his tractor. <laughs> yeah, you know, he 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 was really a homebody, and um, I I really don't think he liked traveling too much. You know, um, there's no no question that uh, that that many people uh, from all. Uh, phases of the music business are uh, aware of him now. I'm, I mean, I know that uh, Vince Gill was a very <clears throat> big fan of his. In fact, I did a, one of the first benefits for Danny. Vince Gill was on the on the bill as well, and that was the first thing that we did for his family down in. Uh, I think it was at the Wax, not the Wax Museum. I can't remember what the venue was in Maryland, but uh, you know, all, all everybody loved Danny. He was great. So generally, over over the years, what what do you look for in musicians to make them the type of musician that you like to work with? Uh, well, you know, uh, there's a there's a whole different trip between studio players and road cats that play live. You know, I mean, uh, and if you can find the ones that can do both, that's that's really where it's at. So that's that's really what I like to uh, look for. I mean. Um, Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, if, if you're if you're working in uh, close proximity and for weeks at a time on the road, uh, you want to have people that are uh, jovial and that you can get on with as well. So, you know, I mean, <clears throat> we have uh, Chris and I are working with these two fellows from Detroit right now, uh, the rhythm section, and uh, although they're younger than us, well, who isn't? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> they're a lot of fun and and uh you know it's a good band i think uh you should invite us down man you know yeah. I, it's it's amazing we've played all over the world but i have not been to australia i can't believe it you haven't no it'd be fantastic to get you down here there's certainly uh, no shortage of uh of venues and great festivals that uh you would uh slide into beautifully well, John, you've got my number, dude. So call me anytime. <laughs> uh, I might send you some info, some um, some contacts that you might be able to uh, make. Uh, well, that would be awesome, man. Yeah. So, what 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 is the extent of your live performing these days? What what about it? I'm sorry. Uh, well, how much of the year would you spend on the road now? Well, you know, um, I, I was doing a lot of work in Europe uh, up until six months ago. Um, I've I, I had a falling out with the booking agent that I was working with and uh, in fact you can tell people that the, the website that people might go to the robertgordon.dk is not a s official website in fact this guy is, is not not a good person he's, he's done things to, uh, not, to to my detriment I'm afraid he, he, it was it was not a good uh, farewell you know with this guy anyway um, and so I've hooked up with a new manager, a fellow that I uh, used to work with many years ago, who is putting tours together for us now as we speak. So, uh, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't like to go out for more than three weeks at a time these days. It's, uh, you know, uh, we used to go out for two months at a time, and it's it's too much of a grind, really. Yeah. If you could, but I love performing. I, I love, you know, I think more than ever, I love getting in front of the audience and. And doing what we do because uh, it's such a good band, and you know, it's just, I just want people to see it, man. Yeah, so it's just the traveling. If you could snap your finger and go from gig to gig, that would be perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't mind. You know, as I said, you know, up to three weeks is cool with me. You know, yeah. I don't, I, and then it's, you know, and then a couple of weeks off, and then we do it again. You know, if if you could go back to the very start of your career and uh, change one thing, is there anything you would do differently next time around? Oh boy! Well, let's see. Uh, at one point, there was a, a song that I uh, um, should have given to Clive Davis, who wanted it for uh, a, a, a very well-known group. And I was convinced that after my contract with RCA, that this song was going to be my ticket to uh, to another big recording deal. And unfortunately, it wasn't. So. And <laughs> that's the one regret I really have <laughs> that I didn't give this particular song, which I still have in the can, by the way, to Clive Davis. Uh. Other than that, man, you know I've had a, a great, a great ride, and I, you know I just love, love the music, and uh, I'll still do it as long as I can, man. 
And uh, upcoming plans at all? Is there any recording plans in the wind at all? Uh, well, we did a, we did some tracks in actually in Norway uh, last year, and unfortunately they were done with that person I told you about, so I don't think we're going to be finishing those. Uh. But uh, prior to that, we did a, 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 and I don't know if you got it down there because uh, it sort of came and went fast. Uh, uh, they talked me into doing a tribute to Presley, Elvis Presley, and Chris and I did an album with the Jordan Dares called It's Now or Never. It's a terrific album mm. on, on Ryko, and uh, if you can find that, that's the latest thing we did. It's quite quite good. I'm proud of it. But uh, for the upcoming future, right now we're just uh, concentrating on on uh, on putting shows together. Fantastic. Well, Robert, thanks yeah. so much for your time. It's uh, been a real pleasure to catch up with you, and thanks for all the wonderful music over the years. Thank you, and uh, hope to hope to meet you sometime. Man. Yeah, let's see if we can organise something. I'll definitely uh, gather up some information and send it over to you. Fantastic. Thanks right. again, John. Thanks, Robert. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.